In today's show, looking at the booking and arraignment of Donald Trump. On Tuesday, the former president surrendered to authorities at a federal courthouse in Miami, then pleaded not guilty to 37 felony charges around his handling of classified documents. Trump became the first president to ever be arraigned on federal charges. The courtroom scene in Miami came just over two months after Trump pled not guilty to 34 felony criminal charges in New York in a separate case brought by Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg involving the payment of hush money during Trump's 2016 campaign. The United States is now facing an unprecedented situation. A former president who was impeached twice and is now facing multiple indictments as he attempts to run again for the White House. The federal case was brought by special counsel Jack Smith, who observed Tuesday's proceedings in the Miami courtroom. After Trump was freed without bail, he flew to his Bedminster, New Jersey golf club, where he gave a speech claiming he's the victim of political persecution. During the same address, Trump threatened to carry out his own political persecutions if he is elected president in 2024. A real special prosecutor to go after the most corrupt president in the history of the United States of America, Joe Biden, and the entire Biden crime family. Name a special prosecutor. And all others involved with the destruction of our elections, our borders, and our country itself. They're destroying our country. While many Republican lawmakers and presidential candidates are defending Donald Trump, Trump's former attorney general, William Barr, appeared on Fox News Sunday, said Trump is, quote, toast if the allegations set out in the indictment are true. I think the counts under the Espionage Act uh, that he willfully retained those documents are solid counts. Now, I, I do think we have to wait and see what the defense uh, says and, and, and what proves to be true. But I do think that even half of what Andy McCarthy said, which is, is if even half of it is true, then he's toast. I mean, it's a it's a pretty it's a very detailed indictment uh, and it's very, very damning. To talk more about the arraignment of Donald Trump, we're joined by Noah Bookbinder, president of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, or crew. He's formerly prosecuted public corruption cases for the Department of Justice. Noah, welcome to Democracy Now! Can you respond to uh, what happened yesterday in that Miami courtroom? Is it fair to say that President Trump was arraigned and arrested? Is that accurate? Uh, it is accurate as, as a technical matter. He, you know, he came in. He was arraigned. Um, you know, he was he wasn't arrested in the sense of having of being you know, picked up at his house and hauled in or anything like that. But um, but he he was uh, processed, booked um, as as part of um, having been charged in federal court, and that's an extraordinary thing. That's never happened to a former president of the United States. Uh, it is something that I think those of us who have been watching President, former President Trump carefully for a number of years uh, have, have foreseen because he's someone who committed uh, or at least uh, was credibly alleged to have committed so many offenses in the course of his presidency and his run for the presidency and his run for reelection that in some ways this felt inevitable. But what an extraordinary thing to happen in the United States. Well, talk about how extraordinary it was, how unusual this is, and the significance of this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of it starts with the indictment itself. It's really a remarkable document. Um, even for somebody who's, who's read a lot of federal criminal indictments, uh, this was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Um, you know, the, the, uh, it, it spells out uh, how significant these documents were that Donald Trump had in, in his possession at Mar-a-Lago and knowingly had. These were uh, nuclear uh, capabilities of the United States and allies. They were uh, potential uh, military plans. Um, so, you know, that's extraordinary. Uh, these scenes that are described in the indictment of Donald Trump showing the showing uh, highly, highly classified documents to uh, somebody from his political action committee, to 
uh, journalists that he was meeting with, people with no clearance, and talking about how these were secret documents that were classified that he really shouldn't be showing. Uh, it, it's, it's a scene that's hard to imagine with the president of the United States. The, the sort of shocking uh, description of boxes being moved at Donald Trump's instruction uh, to hide them from his own lawyers and from the Department of Justice. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like something from uh, from a movie rather than something from real life. Uh, you know, there, there are the, you know, kind of incredible parts of that indictment uh, going through all of the times that Donald Trump in 2016 talked about how important it was for a president to understand uh, our laws about classified documents and to follow those and enforce them, showing that this is not somebody who didn't know what was going on here. Uh, and so it, it really is uh, you know, lays out a remarkable case. It has pictures of these boxes, including classified documents, on the stage in the ballroom at uh, Mar-a-Lago. Um, it, it is uh, it, it is a, a, a remarkably crafted indictment uh, that sets out a uh, unique and, and and kind of shocking set of facts. And in, in terms of the uniqueness of these charges, uh, Noah Bookbinder, you've pointed out that Donald Trump was not charged with the retention of a, any of the documents. He, he returned voluntarily. So none of his charges are for the kind of conduct, for example, that President Biden or, or former Vice President Pence or others had a, of, a, of a re, a temper, uh, retaining documents for a period of time, but then giving them back. Could you talk further about that? That's absolutely right. I mean, there, there are really key differences between what President Trump is alleged and what the evidence suggests that, that he likely did and what, um, uh, what we understand happened with people like President Biden and former Vice President Pence. Uh, first of all, the number of documents is, is of a whole different scale. Uh, the fact that uh, there seems to be a lot of evidence that he knew that he had these documents, that he kept them intentionally, whereas with uh, President Biden, with former Vice President Pence, the evidence, as we understand it, suggests that they inadvertently took these documents, that as soon as they, um, as they found out about them, they cooperated completely with investigators, they returned the documents. Um, that's not what happened with President Trump. But, but as you pointed out, the really key factor is that even putting aside what Donald Trump knew and how many documents were at issue, he wasn't charged with the well over 100 documents that he kept for uh, many, many months at Mar-a-Lago, um, but then did return voluntarily, which, which would look sort of like, on a larger scale, the kinds of things that happened with President Biden and former, uh, and former Vice President Pence. Instead, he was only charged in connection with those documents that he continued to keep, knowing that the Department of Justice was, uh, was requesting them, uh, was in, actually had, had gotten a grand jury subpoena for them. And at that point, he continued to keep them. He uh, instructed people, apparently, to hide them. Um, and so he, th this is it, it is his obstruction um, and his, his willful obstruction based on the evidence that we understand that led to this place. It's quite likely, it appears from this indictment, that if when the first the National Archives and then the Department of Justice requested those documents back, if he had just given them back, uh, he wouldn't have been facing these charges. But he didn't do that. He, he chose knowing full well that he wasn't supposed to have these documents, that the government wanted them back, to continue uh, to keep them, and, and he went, took extraordinary steps to keep them from the government. And I wanted to ask you also about what happens from here on in. Clearly, it's in the government's interest to move to trial as quickly as possible, especially in light of the fact that uh, Trump is running for president ag uh, again. And uh, it's in Trump's interest to delay the proceedings as much as possible. I'm wondering your sense of what will unfold. Yeah, absolutely. The, the federal government uh, is subject to uh, legislation called the, the Speedy Trial Act, which says that a case is actually supposed to go to trial within 70 days of an indictment. Um, now, there are lots of things that can, that can stop that, that count of, of 70 days, um, and, and a lot of those are in place to protect a defendant, to make sure a defendant has a right to 
um, to, to thoroughly make their case and, and, and explore the government's case. Um, and so, you know, when a defendant files motions, uh, whether it's to dismiss the case or whether it's to keep out certain kinds of evidence, um, the, the, the counting toward, toward that 70-day uh, period stops. Um, I think that you're right that the, uh, the prosecutors are going to try to move this as quickly as possible, uh, understanding that they don't want to be in a situation of having a trial as elections are, are approaching. Um, and uh, Donald Trump, for years in uh, civil litigation of all kinds, has used delay tactics. He's a master at it. Um, and you know, I certainly expect that that will that will be the case here. That he will he will move to have the charges thrown out. He will challenge every aspect of this prosecution. Um, I do think that it is eminently possible for uh, this case to go to trial and get through trial uh, well before the 2024 election. Uh, in in there, there obviously there aren't cases similar to this. But looking at other complicated, high-profile uh, cases like, for instance, Roger Stone and Paul Manafort, two uh, uh, associates of Donald Trump who went to trial. Both of those were completed within a year of when they were indicted. Uh, this case, for all its extraordinary nature, is not a terribly complicated case, and there's no reason that it shouldn't be able to come to trial within a year or so. But I th do think that Donald Trump will do everything in his power to delay, because that's what he tends to do. Everyone knows the saying, uh, justice delayed is justice denied. And this point you're making of him wanting to delay it, um, I have a couple questions on this. Uh, right now, he is charged with his co-conspirator, Walt Nauta, who is called his body man, right? He did not plead yesterday. He did not have a local lawyer. Could, if he has to get that lawyer, that lawyer say, I need maybe up to three months or something to get ready. And a judge who is clearly extremely pro-Trump and appointed by Trump, right, Tr uh, Judge uh, Aileen Cannon, um, also, if she wants to delay this, certainly is in charge of that schedule. Now, yesterday, the judge was Judge Jonathan Goodman, um, the magistrate judge. But what happened with Nauta and also his warning that Trump, who came in with Nauta, drove in with Nauta, left with Nauta, is not allowed to talk to Nauta or other witnesses? And will their trials be separate? Uh, so I think a lot of this were we're just starting to figure out, and I think the court is just starting to figure out. Um, you know, I think that that Nada not coming in with an attorney who was, uh, you, you know, who was a local attorney who could stand in that court, this is pretty standard stuff. The court can pretty quickly um, either compel Nada to, to find an attorney or help him to find an attorney. That happens, that kind of thing happens all the time. It can be pretty quickly resolved, uh, and, and I expect that it will be. Um, you know, Judge Cannon, uh, in the earlier uh, litigation about the search of Mar-a-Lago, uh, oh, no. issued these uh, really extraordinary uh, decisions in Donald Trump's favor, which were so contrary to the law that uh, an, appe an appeals panel, which included several judges also appointed by President Trump, uh, not only reversed her, but in really, really harsh terms. Um, so that's obviously cause for some concern. That said, that's already happened. And, you know, I think Judge Cannon, uh, I, I believe and, and hope, will be chastised by what happened before it actually happened in two separate rounds. And I, I believe will uh, will feel some need to uh, preside over this matter in a way that is fair and, uh, and, and, and legally proper. Uh, she will certainly have a lot of control over the schedule. That's something that is a bit worrisome, that, that obviously uh, we'll all have to keep an eye on. Um, but I think that, that Special Prosecutor Jack Smith will be watching closely, that if she does anything that seems out of line with the law, he will go back up to the 11th Circuit, to the Court of Appeals that, 
that oversees the, the district court in Florida, and I expect that they will not hesitate to act again if it gets to that point, which, which I hope that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. As far as separate trials, I think it's too early to say. Um, and, you know, th 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 that, um, you know, I do think that that order— um, Meaning, could they flip— As to not Could talking, they flip Walt Nauta? I, I think that is certainly a possibility. Uh, I, I mean, the, these the facts in this indictment are, as I said, really unusual, um, and and the evidence seems very very strong. Most defendants would have pled guilty already. Um, you know, people in situations like Donald Trump, um, but in in many cases much much less severe, have quickly pled guilty. I don't expect Donald Trump to do that. That's not his style. Uh, Nada, I, I don't. I don't think any of us know all that much about Walt Nada. Uh, certainly, based on the evidence, you would expect him to quickly plead guilty. But he does seem to have an awful lot of loyalty to Donald Trump. Um, it, it is a, sort of a difficult situation. We don't yeah. have much time, but I wanted to ask you about crew pursuing okay. Trump's disqualification to run for president under the Fourteenth Amendment. Can you explain? Yeah, absolutely. So the 14th Amendment to the Constitution has a provision that was put in after the Civil War uh, that says that if you swore an oath uh, to defend the Constitution and then you engaged in insurrection, you are disqualified from federal or state office, including the presidency. Um, it, was, it was meant to, to say that people who try to overthrow a government are not then allowed to be in charge of that same government. Um, and that is something that is very much good law today. Uh, my organization crew was actually able to go to court in, in New Mexico and get a decision that uh, a county commissioner in New Mexico who in, uh, participated in the January 6, 2021 insurrection uh, was, was removed from office and disqualified from future office. And that's something that, uh, by its facts, should apply, we believe does apply to Donald Trump, and it's going to be really important. Um, even if he is uh, convicted of federal offenses, that doesn't prohibit him from running for president. It doesn't prohibit him from, from serving for, for president, but the Constitution does. And, uh, you know, it, it's crucial to protect this country from future insurrections, future efforts to overturn elections. And we believe that, that enforcing this, this really important, even if largely forgotten, provision of the Constitution is a, is a crucial way to make sure that that doesn't happen going forward. Uh, and last question, we just have 20 seconds. You have the president, Republican presidential candidates that continue to defend him, and then you have people like Nikki Haley, the former U.S. ambassador to the U.N. under Trump, the former South Carolina governor, sort of flipping a bit and saying, well, if it's serious, if these, if the, if it's true, um, President Trump was reckless, but that if she became president, she would pardon him. And this has been floated several times by candidates. What about that? Uh, well, look, uh, th these are all people who in the past have talked about certainly the importance of national security, the importance of protecting classified information. Uh, I think it's hard for them to now come out and say it doesn't matter. Uh, and so it, it is at least a little bit of a shift, makes some sense. Um, it is hard to know what to do with a former president who uh, appears to have, have violated the criminal law. It is difficult for the country. Um, I don't think that uh, a pardon is appropriate here, um, because I think you do need accountability for this kind of lawlessness. Um, but it's good to see candidates at least struggling with these, these issues rather than simply defending Donald Trump at all costs. Noah Bookbinder, we want to thank you for being with us, President of Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, or crew, formerly prosecuted public corruption cases at the Department of Justice. Coming up, while Donald Trump was freed without bail for violating the Espionage Act, we'll look at how whistleblowers, reality winner Daniel Hale and others were treated very differently.